thanks for joining us today, Rob. You're welcome. Good stuff. Why don't you uh, just give us a bit of background for, for, for the individuals in the room, uh, talking about your journey into systematic trading. Um, well, as you said, I've been trading for a while, as you can tell with the fact I've got almost no hair left. Um, I think I did my first trade probably in about 99. Um, first started trading professionally in about 20 years ago now uh, as an exotic rates, rates trader. And that was not systematic trading, but it was quantitative trading because I was trading quite complicated things that were very difficult to price. Um, and then, yeah, I, I joined um, Man AHL in 2006. Um, and that from then on, really, I've been purely systematic. So with them for seven years, and for my maths isn't very good, eight and a half years, I think, since then, with just trading my own money. So um, I, I've spent almost longer trading systematically than the age of two of my children. If that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> so I've got two, two children who are younger than my systematic training career and one who's a couple of years older. Yeah, good stuff. Um, look, we'll just go straight into, into, the, into the nuts and bolts of... of, of system design and, and how it's and your systems specifically and how they're coping with these markets at the moment um, for just a bit more of a plug um, Rob's a, a, a guest on um, I'm traders oh, co-host co-host co co sorry don't downgrade <laughs> I'm just telling you uh, if you haven't if you don't if you haven't listened to it do listen to it Neil's Kasha Larson and then some of the other guests are fantastic if you if you want to learn more about that and actually get sort of live updates it's a fantastic podcast um, to listen to as well. Anyway, so let's let's crack on with with, with um, yeah, the information here. It's been it's been obviously a very interesting year, tumultuous year in in financial markets. Uh, as I say, you know you're systematic, um, but do you care why a market is going from A to B? You know the quality of the journey, or is it just it's doing what the system decides to do? Does the why create biases for you? Do you care why it goes from A to B? <sighs> Yes. Um, I mean, you shouldn't, right? You should, if you're trading systematically, you should really not care what's happening. The, the price is just a number and you're following a trend on that number or, or whatever system that you're using. Um, but, but we're all human and it's very difficult to um, kind of ignore what's going on. Um, and that means you're very tempted then to, to sort of fiddle with your system. And ironically, I would say since I started trading my own money, I've actually become much better at this. Um, because when I was you know, working professionally, you know, I was sitting in front of a Bloomberg terminal, so I had constant kind of news coming in about the markets. And inevitably, I'd be linking that back to the positions we had and the trades we had and saying, oh, why is the system doing this? this is interesting. Maybe it shouldn't be doing this. Whereas now I've been able to set myself up with, you know, everything running on a box somewhere. Um, I literally, just before this talk, had to go and see what my positions were because I genuinely did not know what my positions were. Um, I, I do get myself sent sort of diagnostic reports every day by the computer to tell me that it hasn't done anything crazy. Um, but, but yeah, generally speaking, I've sort of built a wall of kind of things to, to, to keep my hands away from the system and to make it really hard for me to, to actually make changes to it. Yeah. Um, we used to joke that, that we should all create the system and then change the password to something and then tear the password up and forget it. So we'd never be tempted to take the, change the system ever again. Obviously, that's probably a little bit irresponsible, but, but you know, that, that's almost the level I think you need to be at. Yeah, right. Uh, so I want to touch on um, the strategy going into the actual system design. You are known i think probably more uh, i think it's fair to say as as a trend follower or well, yeah <laughs> but you by that you do have other strategies as well so talk to us and talk to the audience about the type of uh, strategies that you run as a systematic uh, a trader yeah i mean i do have a bias towards trend following which partly comes from my previous career because ahl was originally a trend following fund um i would say probably about 60 percent of my portfolio now is in trend following and the nice thing about trend following is it kind of does its own risk management, right? So if the price starts to move against you, you automatically cut the position. Whereas if you're doing more of a kind of mean reversion or relative value type strategy where you're trying to buy low and sell high, okay, you buy low and then it keeps moving against you. What do you do? You know, you need to have some kind of extra risk management tool built in there. Whereas if it's a trend following system, okay, you buy, the trend's going up, you've bought, you're happy. The moment the trend starts to turn against you by a certain amount, you automatically close your position. You don't need to think about the point at which that happens. It's just part of the system naturally. But yeah, I do other things like like carry, um, which I guess in FX, most people are familiar with the idea of collecting interest rate differentials. Um, but you can do the same thing in other asset classes. Um, I do a little bit of um, kind of mean reversion within asset classes. Um, I have systems that look at the trend of an entire asset class and sort of build up from that rather than just focusing on the individual instruments. Um, I've got things that look at things like the skew. So 
if a market is, is really, from a risk perspective, insanely horrible and ugly, actually that's often a good time to buy it. If you've got the, um, you know, well, that's the nice thing about being in the computer, right? The computer will not care that it's a horrible, ugly market. It will just buy it anyway. And as long as your risk management's in place and your positions aren't too large, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, if I have anything engraved on my, my tombstone, it would be diversification um, because I'm a huge believer in diversification of all different kinds. That's really interesting. So you've got diversification in strategy. It's been a fantastic year for trend following this year, but it's not always a great year for trend following. Um, this year has been the year of buying high and selling high, right? You know, body in motion stays in motion and those factors. Honing in on that trend following strategy, you I'm guessing you don't just run one trend following strategy, you run multiple ones. But is there one that we can sort of pick out and take the inputs that people in the audience can look at and, and maybe adapt to? So is there one that, that you look at sort of more more closely for retail traders? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of my stuff is built around something that for me is very simple, which is just two moving averages of different lengths and you just essentially buy if the fast moving averages um, goes above the slow moving average and vice versa. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. And, and that, that, but I've got lots of things that, that work on variations of that. So I've, for example, I briefly mentioned the idea of trend following an entire asset class. So, you know, there's some complexity involved in essentially creating a synthetic index for say, you know, the bond, the bond market. Um, and then, and then, you know, I, but then I, the thing I use to actually decide whether there's a trend or not is exactly the same thing. So yeah, probably half my system, yeah, 60% is trend following and probably about two thirds of that is, is just to build mostly around ideas of simple moving averages. Um, I mean, I'm a believer that um, a trend's a trend yeah. and you can come up with a hundred different ways of finding trends. And I know that there are some people here tonight who will tell you about their favorite way. <laughs> but to be honest with you, when you look at the correlation of, of all these things, it's, they're very similar. Um, and I don't believe there's a kind of magic one that works very well. So that's why I like to diversify across lots of different things. Yeah. Um, but the advantage of the moving average for me, at least, is I find it very intuitive and simple to understand. Cool. If anyone wants to pick Rob's brain afterwards on on system design and, and, and basic trend following systems, I think he'd be very happy to talk to you about that. But when I look at the multiple asset classes with trend following, I think you have to have a, a, a major project range. If you've got If you're trading off six assets, six markets, six instruments, you've got to find something that's trending. You might never trade. So I understand trend following as needing a large product range for your system to, to choose one. Um, with that in mind, talk to me about the characterization of, of a trend. You know, if I look at FX, for example, does it trend for much shorter periods of time than, say, agricultural commodities or fixed income, for example? When you're talking about trends within um, asset class, what's the sort of character and hold times and those factors you look at? I'm not a great fan of sort of fitting systems specifically for a particular asset class or instruments. So I, I don't like to, for example, trade, you know, corn differently from S&P 500. Yeah. Um, the exception is trading costs. So something like the S&P 500 is very cheap to trade. Something like, I don't know, Euro dollar futures, say, are very expensive to trade because they've They've got very low volatility and I look at costs on a risk adjusted basis, therefore the risk adjusted costs are very high. So I will trade Euro dollar much slower than S&P, but the, the kind of menu of things I'm picking from is the same. It's just that there's a section of the menu I ignore for Euro dollar because it's just too expensive. Mm. Look, going back to the, the trend following systems, um, as I say, like if, if I, I mean, there's probably a million benchmarks you can use that the, the CTAs and trend following systematic funds use. But let's say, let's use the SG STA index. It's up 22% this year. Um, obviously, you apply leverage to that and you've done pretty well. Um, we've seen some outrageous trends in, in markets this year. I mean, you can go back to beginning of the year, you know, NatGas was up 150% in a couple of months. We saw you know, the yen has, has been trending you know, for parts of the year. It's now trending. It's getting smashed as we speak at the moment. Um, fixed income, we saw two-year treasuries going from, what, 30 basis points to 280 basis points. So it's been a year of trend um, that's come through in that market. So I know a lot of people have been selling strength, but for you as a trend follower, How's your performance? But I mean, this isn't a, a chance for you to plug, but it's more plugging trend following in this market. Um, yeah, I mean, if I look, if I look, for example, a few weeks ago, I, I looked at the performance of all my individual strategies year to date, and actually, all the trend following strategies have done amazingly well. The carry, not so well, 
But I, I'm happy with that because, as I said, I like the idea of diversification. There'll be years when trend following doesn't work and carry does work. Um, but yeah, if you, if you look at, say, the industry benchmarks, I think it's the best ever year for that particular index that you mentioned, certainly since, I don't know, maybe 2008, which was a very good year um, for, for trend following. For me personally, um, it's probably my best year since, I don't know, 2014. So I'd say it's a once in a decade kind of year for trend following. So we, would, would, we are talking about, um, you know, extremely good performance, definitely. And, you know, touch, <laughs> I don't know if that's even wood. So, so how Touch that, will continue to the end of the year. So how does that work then? If, you, if your trend following systems and your systems are, are doing so well, but you've also got a mean reversion system in the market, then you've got diversification in strategy. So can you talk to the audience about how the benefits of, of, of having diversification, not just in, in, in the instruments you're trading within one strategy, trend following, but also then having diversification in the strategy as well helps you in, um, in your performance? I mean, sort of... Basic financial maths is if you've got two assets that aren't perfectly correlated but have positive returns, then you do better by trading both of them rather than only trading one of them. So that's really what I'm all about. I'm trying to look for lots of things which individually may not do that well, um, but when you combine them together, they do extremely well. Um, and so just let's take trend following, and you, you said you need to trade lots of things for it to work. Mm. So the if I go from, say, trading one instrument to trading 100, then the kind of returns, risk adjusted returns in my portfolio will increase by a factor of five, which there are not many places you can get a factor <laughs> no. of five improvement in performance. So it really is astonishingly powerful. Um, combining different kinds of systems together, so combining trend with carry and so on and so forth, isn't quite as good. You're, you're, rather than a five-fold increase, you're probably looking at maybe doubling your performance yeah. and going from one simple system to going the, to sort of the variety of things that I trade. Um, but because I'm fully automated, this is free for me, right? It doesn't cost me any extra effort. I would write another 20 lines of code or something, and then it just works. Um, obviously, if I was trading in a discretionary fashion, there's no way I could track 100 markets. Well, for starters, my monitor's like this big. <laughs> so, um, and I've only got one monitor, you know, whereas when I was in investment banking, I had, you know, eight monitors. So, yeah, um, so yeah it's, it's, um, it's a huge benefit of trading systematically. And, um, you know, but, I, but yeah, it would be very hard to do without that. I want to touch on with mean reversion because I know there's a lot of people in this room who probably counter trend or you know, what, we what we should call mean reversion and what mean reversion actually means for you. But I want to touch on sizing positions and coming back to sort of trading the headlines and, and, and how you within, yeah, let's go to back to the trend following system, um, how you size positions when the system picks up a trending market. Um, what is your approach to... Um, to, to, to correctly sizing a position, which to me is the most one of the most important parts of trading. What do you look for and how is it adapted to the changes in volatility we've seen this year? Yeah, I mean, so, so basically it's inverse volatility weighting. So the risky something is the less of it I need to, hit to, to buy a particular amount of risk. Um, and that will mean that if it gets much riskier, then my position will be cut automatically. Yeah. So a really good example of this would be crude, a WTI crude, I don't trade Brent. Um, I've been long that for quite some time, but if you look at my position at, I think it was around the 9th of March, um, when things kind of went a bit crazy, there was a very sharp rally and then there were almost equally sharp sell-off. Um, I actually maintained my position in that market because the trend was still upwards, um, but my position was probably cut, in, cut by a half, maybe two thirds even, because the market had got almost overnight, twice or even three times riskier. Yeah. Um, and as a previous speaker said, um, you know, the other thing you would do if you were using stop losses in that situation would be to wide, widen your stop. Um, now, there are a few couple of tweaks that I make to this method, which is the method that pretty much all systematic CTOs use. Um, I'm really scared about being in a market where the risk at the moment is currently really, really low. And that's because I have kind of burned into me the situation in sort of 2007 when volatility, like the VIX was like nine or something, right? So volatility was just insanely low. Um, and then almost overnight, it just ballooned. And we had all these massive, massive positions on because volatility was so low. Um, so um, one thing I do now actually is, is I use a blend of a, a long run and a short run risk estimate, which, which effectively means that when risk gets really, really low, I don't leverage up quite as much as I, as I would have done in the past. A standard deviation. Uh, yeah, I use standard deviation, but to be honest, again, it's like different types of pick ways of picking up trend. It doesn't really matter whether you use ATR or standard deviation yeah. or something else. 
most risk measures do broadly the same thing. Cool. Um, just talking about the here and nows, um, I'm guessing there's a lot of FX traders in the room who've probably been all over the yen move today um, and the last couple of days. I mean, it's getting absolutely smoked at the moment. Is this something that, you're, that you've got a position in? I'm guessing you probably... I, I actually need to check. <laughs> I'm, I'm seriously... First of all, I've got a terrible short-term memory. And uh, yeah, because it's all automated. Uh, yes, I'm short yen. Thank yeah. goodness for that. <laughs> so I'm probably up today because I'm also long crude and that's gone up too. So yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Just keeping it pretty brief because I think we're right, we're out of time now. What are the three main pointers for people to get into system design and systematic trading? I was expecting this question. I'm prepared for this one. Okay, go for it. Um, can I answer a different question? Go on. <laughs> the, the the three things. If I if everyone else says to me three three pieces of advice for traders particularly systematic traders, it's don't trade too often, don't trade in too much size, and if you are trading systematically, don't overfit your system and make it assume that the past is too much like the future. Uh, yeah, if you want like advice on what programming language and stuff like that to learn, that'll have to wait after the break, because there's no way I can answer it quickly enough. So. Yeah, good stuff. All right, we are out of time, but there's some yeah, really good good interactions there. Um, as I say, like, I, this is a book that I've got, it's Leverage Trading, it's got a lot of the stuff about system design and, and you know, how you manage your risk. Um, talk to Rob, he'll be, he'll be lurking around afterwards as well um, about you know, some of his methods and, and some of explore some of the bits and pieces that he's doing. So really good to have uh, Rob with us today. So thanks for your thoughts and uh, your words. Cheers, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.